Welcome to Shoreline Conversations. This is episode five and our fifth week in our series on Romans, where we're following the messages from Sunday mornings at Shoreline. If you want to hear those messages, you can find them online or on our YouTube channel, our website, shoreline.church. Um, you don't have to have heard those to uh, find these uh, podcasts uh, interesting and helpful, hopefully, but um, it will definitely give a little more context. So check those out if you're interested. But today, Today, uh, Cole is talking to Pastor Kevin about salvation. So, Kevin, thank you for uh, sitting down with us. This is our fifth episode. It feels like yeah. we've been doing this for years, and we know what we're doing in Old the pros. direction. Yeah. Uh, but hey, so we just before we um, kind of really dig into uh, what we're going to talk about um, this uh, Sunday, you talked a lot about and your focus is on salvation. Yeah. So, um, just before we dig deeper on that, just kind of uh, let's just set the table a little bit and, and start with what exactly is it that we need saving from? Yeah. Well, one of the things we looked at in the message was that, that, you know, Romans six, seven, and eight, one of the kind of epic themes there is we're talking about orthodoxy. What is that we believe Mm -hmm. is the topic of salvation. Uh, But if all you want to say is all people have sinned, Jesus died for their sins. He can pay for it. Mm -hmm. You don't need chapter six, seven, and eight of Romans. You can say that in what I just did in about, in about two sentences. Yeah. And so, you know, what we need salvation from, yes, ultimately it's sin. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's the consequence of sin. It's the punishment for sin. Uh, But we also need salvation from ourselves. We need salvation from uh, legalism. You know, salvation is to be set free from, to have the power of something over us broken. And so you start reading Romans 6, 7, and 8, and you realize that um, we looked at 11 different aspects of kind of lessons to learn about salvation one of them is the salvation through Jesus alone. One of them is, is that, you know, that, that the power of the Spirit, once we're saved, that the Spirit enters us. And so there's this bigger picture than just sort of a simplistic, well, all human beings have done wrong and have offended God, we're distant from God, and we need salvation from the judgment of hell. Mm-hmm. Now, I would say that's absolutely true. Yeah. But something could be true and not be the whole story. Right. And so there's a lot more involved. And, and what we discover in, in this portion of Romans is that... We need salvation from all kinds of things and that Jesus Christ is the answer to all those things. Right. So, so what is it specifically about Jesus, the person of Jesus Mm -hmm. that saves us from those things that you're mentioning right now? Yeah. Well, the, you know, so it's what it is about Jesus and his power to save depends on what aspect of salvation we're talking about. So, you know, if, if what you're talking about is, is that extremely important and core, uh, but not exclusive aspect of we need salvation from our sins and the judgment of sin and hell, then what it is about Jesus at that point is mm-hmm. he died on the cross in our place for our sins, bearing our sins, saying it is finished, paying the price, mm-hmm. his death on the cross. That's you know, what Jesus does is he becomes the, the uh, what the theologians would call it, the substitutionary atonement. Yeah. He, he substitutes and comes in our place to take our punishment. So what it is about Jesus is he died on the cross for our sins. Absolutely. But if you say, well, part of salvation is that, and you see in, Ro- in this portion of Romans that the that when we are saved, the Spirit of God moves in and indwells us. Well, that part of Jesus is that he is the center of the Spirit. He's mm-hmm. the one who, who breathed the Spirit of God into us and actually said to his disciples, you know, it's better for you that I go away because when I go away, and it would be hard for his disciples to even imagine anything being better than yeah. having Jesus right there. But he says, but when I go away, I will send the comforter that you're the paraclete, the spirit to be with you, to be in you. And so in terms of the the work of salvation that we're filled with the spirit, what Jesus does there is sends the spirit. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, it's the spirit of Jesus comes and and, Mm -hmm. and dwells each one of us. So Jesus says it's better because literally the spirit will come be in you. And because the the spirit is fully God and it's the spirit of Jesus, it's Jesus then dwelling in each one of us. Right. and so if, if it's, it's sh- you know, shame and guilt that Romans, you know, Romans 6, 7, and 8 also deal with the issue of the shame of guilt and condemnation, we're saved from shame. We're saved from guilt. Well, mm-hmm. how does Jesus do that? Well, he's the one who pays the price and bears our sins and washes them away so that we can look and say, you know, like the Apostle Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? He took our condemnation. Mm-hmm. So if you're talking about you know, salvation from guilt and, and, you know, being saved from and delivered from guilt and the weight of guilt. It's the fact that Jesus took the, the guilt for us. Right. If it's salvation from 
powerlessness into being powerful is that he sent the Holy Spirit. So, but all of these things are functions of Jesus's work through the cross, but it's just, it's, it's multifaceted, it's multidimensional. Yeah. And if all, if all we think about is, well, I've done wrong, I'm guilty, I'm sinful, Jesus died, I accept him, now my sins are gone, I get to go to heaven. Mm-hmm. Um, all those things are absolutely true, but there is so the nuances and the beauty and the power and the glory of his saving work is is really truncated and limited when you think of it just in those terms. Right. So how so just kind of moving forward a little bit, how how is that is is there a reality to um you know, in, in the process of sanctification, becoming more like Christ and mm-hmm. and uh yeah, becoming more like him. Is there is that also in this is that involved in any way? Because I'm hearing like, you know, I know a lot of Christians that that would would say like I've received Christ and I I, I believe him to be my the, my savior my the Lord over my life he died for my sins but there's still this there's a constant reality of guilt and 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 uh, frustration over this the sin the the sin that that Paul talks about like I I, I do what I don't want to do and I know you know yeah. and I know better it, it, is that like a different because that's a different facet of of like the importance of Jesus and salvation yeah. is that like a is it just part of the process of sanctification yeah. or is that? Well, probably our inability to fully understand the power of the saving work yeah. of Jesus doesn't make it any less powerful. Yeah. Um, I think I'm unable to fully comprehend almost anything. Yeah. I've, been mar- I've been married <laughs> for 36 years. And if you think I got my wife figured out, uh, I don't. Um, I've driven a car since I was 16. But if something broke down, I'm finding somebody smarter than me to fix it. So <laughs> I, I've, fair. I've really, I have, I have a probably an appropriate humility that says there's almost nothing I fully understand. Mm -hmm. And so when you have Christians who look and say, I don't live as if there is therefore no condemnation. Mm -hmm. I don't live as if I am my, my sin and shame were nailed to the cross and they're gone. I still struggle with those things. Um, I think that's part of our human condition, Right, right? Our inability to fully apprehend and receive and live in that doesn't mean it's not real. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that it's not fully, uh, fully resolved in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. What it means is we've got to learn more and understand more. Yeah. And so I think I think it's heartbreaking to God when he watches his children live in guilt, live in shame, when he has truly set us free. Right. And when he, and, and I believe that when we understand that freedom, we actually live more for him mm-hmm. in the freedom of the goodness of his grace than we do under the legalism of trying to somehow do enough good things to right. make him love me. Yeah. And so I think that's one of the things that Paul's trying to capture is to set us free that there is no condemnation, that shame is gone, that guilt is gone, that Christ really has dealt with all of that. And so you mentioned like friends and people, you know, and I, and I, not only yeah. would I say I have friends that, that think that way sometimes, I would say I think that Ooh, way yeah, sometimes. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, uh, and so I look and go, yeah, that, that's, that's, and so you mentioned the journey of sanctification. Yes. Sanctification is that journey of becoming more like Jesus and thinking more like him and understanding more of what he's done. Mm-hmm. And I would hope and pray that in six months and a year and in five years and 10 years, each of us understand more of what it is that Christ has done. And we, we live with a greater sense of peace and ease. And I would even say in those moments where you stumble and fall back into a, into a, you know, the, the, the ancients used to call it a besetting sin, right. a sin that kind of keeps creeping up again and yeah. again. Um, and, and when we fall into those things, I would hope that we would much more quickly feel his grace Understand that we're not condemned by because the moment that happens, the enemy goes. You see, yeah, you stink. You're terrible. You're the worst. God can't. How can God love you? How can God forgive you? And Jesus is saying, No, you're fully forgiven. My grace is sufficient. Amen. Get up, walk with me again. Right. And if we grew up in a in a church tradition where we have you know, penance and you have to do so many things to prove yourself right again, right? Um, then we like okay, maybe in, in in a week or two weeks or in a month, if I can be good enough for long enough, then I'll feel like I can approach God again. And right. God says, No, I'm here. My arms are open right now. Mm-hmm. Let it go. Follow me. And that frees you then to then walk with Jesus and not be entrapped by the snares and the lies of the enemy. Right. Yeah. Because it, it just sounds like there's a lot more to this concept of salvation um, and the reality of salvation than just your 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 ticket to heaven. I'm, yeah. I, I've gotten yeah. in. I, 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 I click subscribe and I'm good. And like, yeah. I'm going to get all the notifications and I'm good. But, yeah. uh, I, you know, is there is that the danger of mm-hmm. kind of oversimplifying mm-hmm. the idea of salvation just because... I, I don't, I don't really, I don't, I don't hear a lot of, uh, discussion or, 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 um, talking about these other processes of, of, Mm -hmm. of salvation and, and growing more like Christ to even to the point of 
saying much more quickly to the feelings of guilt or, mm-hmm. or um, uh, shame of a sin or th- yeah. that we've moved past like this, move past that. And, yeah. and you're, you're more quickly able to say, no, I'm forgiven. Yeah. He's washed me clean yeah. and I can move on from this and I can yeah. grow because of this. Yeah. Cole, there is a danger if all we think about salvation as being as well, if I, I've done some wrong stuff, God's not happy about it. I agree with that. I can, I get it. I see that. So if I just say a quick prayer and say, I'm sorry to God, yeah. I'm done with it. And then one day I'll go to heaven and between now and then God's not really part of my life. Uh, and, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, the, the great preacher and kind of activist in the time of, of, uh, Nazi Germany and, and Hitler's power, he stood, he stood up actively against that. Uh, and he wrote a book called the cost of discipleship. And he talked about cheap grace and, and cheap grace being the mm-hmm. sense that, well, because because God's forgiven me, I can kind of do whatever I want. This is what Paul is addressing in Romans chapter six, mm-hmm. uh, at the beginning of Romans chapter six, where he says, "Should I continue in sin that grace may abound?" People were saying, "Well, okay, when I sin, God forgives me, so I'll just keep on sinning because yeah. forgiveness is good, and I like that. So I'll sin, I'll get forgiven, everyone's happy." And you know, when Paul says, "Should we do that?" He says, "He says, may God forbid it, may it never be so." He uses the strongest uh, negation in the in the Greek language to say, "May it never be so." Absolutely not. And so I think what can happen is, you know, I have no question there are people who've been told, listen, just buy this fire insurance policy. Yeah. You know, just say a quick prayer and, and and whether you mean it or not, just do this, do this, you know, kind of follow this formula and you're in the club. Now you can go live with it however you want and and you're covered. Uh, I would, I believe that if a person truly cries on Christ Jesus Christ for salvation, repents of their sin and receives the grace of Jesus, I believe they belong to Jesus Mm -hmm. at that point. But I think there are people who never really from their heart cried out to Jesus. They just followed a formula that they thought they were supposed to do. And that's, that's the dangers. If all, Mm -hmm. if all it really is, is this idea that if you say a quick prayer and and follow this formula, you're in the club and that's all that matters, then we're doing a great disservice if that's what we're preaching. And then you have people who may believe that they have bought their, their policy to get into heaven and they may not really know Jesus. Right. Right. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds like that's kind of your answer too, for the idea of someone's ability to lose their salvation. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, is that, is that connected in any way? Yeah, this, and this, this is, I mean, there's, there's a uh, great debate in Christian circles yeah, I, about I if a person yeah, can yeah. lose their salvation or not. The way I would explain it and, and different church traditions and different theological, um, kind of approaches to this topic are going to come at it differently. And there'll be some, you know, listening to this podcast that'll disagree with me. Yeah. But I actually do believe that if a person has truly, genuinely, authentically received Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. they've come to the cross They've recognized their sin. They've recognized that Jesus Christ, you know, came as God with us. They they confess their sin to Him. They receive His uh, His substitutionary death on the cross. His that He took the place for them, and they cry out to Him with an authentic heart. I believe at that point we are saved and washed clean. Mm-hmm. And where Jesus says in the Gospel of John, where He talks about the fact that no one can snatch you out of My Father's hand, no one can snatch you out of My out of My hand. I and the Father are one. Right. I, I paint the picture like this, and and I sort of, I, I try to describe. I actually preached this in a in a Wesleyan church, one of the largest Wesleyan churches yeah. in the country. And I was preaching the Bible, so nobody came up and complained afterwards. But I think some <laughs> of the people that grew up with the pretty it's, yeah uh, with, with, with the maybe a slightly different theology of this might have struggled. But nobody came and protested because I was staying with the scriptures. But I said, here's how I picture, if this is a Christian, when you become a follower of Jesus, like the passage that we looked at in Romans, uh, the Spirit of God moves into you. So here's you, the Spirit of God lives in you, and then the hand of Jesus, the Son, and the hand of the Father, I don't have an extra hand here, but the hand of the Father, (laughs) hand of the Son, wrap around, so the the Spirit, thank you, you so the Spirit lives within us, God the Father, God the Son, wrap their hands around us, and we belong to Him. And then Jesus says, no one can snatch you out of my hand, no one can snatch you out of my Father's hand, I and the Father are one. There's that sense of that security in that. Mm-hmm. So then when we're struggling, I picture it this way. If we're in the hand of God and we're saying, I'm misbehaving, I'm running around, I'm being naughty. Yeah, you're doing that, but you're in God's hand. Mm-hmm. You say, well, I'm, you know, I, I've, and I've, I've walked with people who have gone through a season of pulling away from Jesus, of struggling, but yeah. who made an authentic you know, commitment to Jesus. And one woman I knew, she had actually married somebody who was a Muslim. She had, you know, she in a public way kind of said, I don't believe that anymore. I'm walking mm-hmm. away from my faith. And she made, and then, then later came back and said, you know, I always knew. Yeah. And I always understood God's grace. And I was, 
you know, kind of kidding myself and kidding everyone else. But but I, she had, I think she had come to an authentic faith in Jesus Christ, and the Spirit of God never yeah. let her go, never left living That's within so her. That's so interesting. But she struggled that whole time. Why, yeah. yeah, but why fight that? Like if you <clears throat> if you have that internal like, yeah. I always knew. Yeah. And I'm not like yeah. in, in any way condemning that. Yeah. I, I just yeah. I know that's an internal struggle for, for that individual, but yeah. that seems so strange to like yeah. fight that and push back and seek another yeah. option yeah. when you just feel, feel like, oh, I know this to be true, yeah. but. Well, it probably goes to what the Apostle Paul says, you know, the very thing I don't want to do, I do. And the thing, yeah. that, that's yeah. our, our human nature. This is why one of, one of the points in the sermon that I made was that, that even when we're saved doesn't mean we no longer face temptation. Mm-hmm. That Jesus himself was tempted and he was God with us. And right. you read Matthew 4, Luke 4, you can't escape the fact that Jesus was tempted. He just didn't give in to it. He didn't yield to the temptation. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, but for us, even when we have faith in Jesus, even when we're, even when we're in this journey of sanctification, there's still temptation, there's still struggles, and there's still times we stumble. Right. But His grace is sufficient, and so, and I think one of the differences, and and I don't, I don't dare to go where I've, I know pastors have written books about you know showing if a person is truly saved or not. And, yeah. And I don't have the, um, I don't have whatever. Um, Whatever gene that is that thinks that you can, that someone thinks they can decide exactly who's saved and who's not by looking at the outside. Yeah. But I believe that internally, if we've received Jesus and it was authentic, we belong to Him. The Spirit lives in mm-hmm. us. The Father and the Son wrap their hands around us. And even the greatest times of struggle, uh, we we don't lose our salvation. We don't run away from God. We may struggle. We may push back, but God does not let us go. Yeah. And uh, and some people say, well, then you're then then how do you know? You, well, you'll know the fruit of it later, and later on you look at the life, you know if it was real or not. Right. I, I'm not going to try to figure all that out, yeah. but I do believe that the scriptures are clear enough that if a person truly has faith in Jesus Christ, they belong to him. Right. And not only can no one snatch us from the Father's hand, we can't snatch ourselves from the Father's mm-hmm. hand or from the Son's hand. Yeah. We can't drive the Spirit of God out of us uh, if we've truly come to a point of salvation. Right. That's my sense from my understanding of scripture. I have. I, I need to say I have dear friends who I love and respect who come from a different stream of looking at things, and, and I believe that they're biblical, they love Jesus, and they will say, no, I think a person can become a Christian, lose their salvation, backslide. I, can I tell you a danger with that mm-hmm. is that I think when you believe that, you spend a lot of time uh, going, am I saved? Am I not? Is what is what I did big enough and bad enough that I lost my salvation? Mm-hmm. So I got to get resaved every time I stumble. What if I believed and then I lost my salvation and then something happens and I die and I didn't get my salvation back? Boy, the level of insecurity. You know, when Paul says there is therefore now no condemnation in Jesus Christ, when he says that we're set free from from sin and from the shame of sin, mm-hmm. I think people like that can end up living in a lot of shame, a lot of sin, a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty instead of the confidence of the work of Jesus. Yes. Yeah, I wanted so I wanted to go back to something you said that it it kind of uh, struck me. It's interesting, you know, you know, some pastors or some some authors that have kind of you know tried to establish this, um, I, I guess, uh, a way of understanding if someone said yes truly or mm-hmm. not. Mm-hmm. Um, but where does so like I, I having heard where you stand on that, where does accountability fall yeah. in that? Cause yeah. I feel like that's a, a, a thing that we're called to, right? Yeah. I mean, we're called yeah. to, to uh, be accountable for one another as yeah. we come into this family of Christians. Yeah. Yeah. So if someone makes that claim that like yeah. I, I've received Christ, but yep. then there's a period where they're like stepping yeah. away. Yeah. I mean, does that have to be like a personal invitation or yeah. is it like, what does that look like? I think when we love Jesus and we love each other, we're going to do those things. Yeah. We're going to ask each other. Uh, and so I've, you know, I've had many friends along the journey uh, who've been committed Christians, who've had times where they struggled, behaved in ways they shouldn't. And I've loved them enough to mm-hmm. point those things out, to ask them the hard questions, to keep them accountable. And they've loved me enough to do the same for me. Right, right. One of the reasons we're afraid to do that is we know that if we do it to someone else, they're going to do it to us. Well, wait, hey, I noticed this in you. Yeah. And so it's not the most attractive thing to put ourselves in that kind of place, but it's a good thing. I think it's actually a good thing in the community of God's family uh, to ask those questions in the same way that if you saw if you saw someone you loved and cared about walking into traffic and I, I get a chance to travel in different parts of the world and there's parts of the world where the traffic comes from the opposite direction mm-hmm. and you can't tell you how many times I've been with somebody who it looks the wrong way sees no cars and I'll grab them and go oh no we're in Ireland or yeah or, and, and, and the, boom a car comes by like yeah. this well I could say hey that's not my business I don't want I don't want to right. bam they can get smacked so I think that. Walking out of God's plan is not the best way to live. It's not the, doesn't lead to the greatest joy, the greatest peace. Uh, and so I think when we see things in ourselves and others, right. asking those questions. And, 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 you know, we both know people who say, well, I, I received Jesus, but there's, there can be, you look and there's like nothing yeah. in their life, in their behavior, in their countenance, in their, what seems to motivate them that even seems to reflect Jesus at all. Mm-hmm. I think at those points, it's fair to ask, you know, to ask in our own hearts, even to say to them, you know, 
do you really do you really know Jesus? Yeah. Because if you really know Jesus, it seems like there's going to be fruit of that salvation. Mm-hmm. It seems like there's going to be a changed heart and your desires will change over time. What I'm cautious about is being the one who, anytime someone doesn't behave exactly like I think they right, should, right. I get to be judge, jury, and executioner. Right. And that's and by the way, the, some of the books I've read aren't people that I know personally, but I've read books of people who I feel like they, they do feel very comfortable being the judge, jury, and executioner, mm-hmm. and they can decide exactly what behaviors and exactly what things reflect if you know Jesus yeah. or not. And if you're not doing this or you're doing that, and then now we're going back into the earlier legalism chapters of Romans. Too. It's the legal yeah. exactly. Now yeah. we're going back into the, the legalism. Yeah. And that's a, that's a dangerous place to be. Totally. Yeah. I I I think it's too uh, something that you said that I I just feel so much resonance with is that with accountability, the concern of, of like, Hey, that strikes me as something I want to talk to him about, but man, I would hate for them to ask me Mm -hmm. about this. But also another thing that I, I personally really struggle with too, with that is, is not, not inconvenient, but but being uh, presumptuous and rude. And like, I have this like over cautiousness Mm -hmm. about um, being kind and gentle and, and, um, honestly not wanting to be in awkward conversations yeah. with people. Yeah. And, yeah. and so I wonder like, is there something, you know, on a, on a little more practical side, yeah. you care about that person, the person yeah. that is yeah. looking the wrong way. Cause they're in Ireland and they're yeah. not paying attention yeah. to the, yeah. the, the oncoming traffic. Yeah. You, you care about that person, yeah. but you don't want to grab the wheel and yank on it, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but you want to give some, have some way to like reach out to them as a yeah. friend, as a, as yeah. a human to human, yeah. like, is there some kind of practical thing? Yeah. Cause I, it can't be just this hard question and yeah. just like slam it down on the table and like, tell me what you think. Yeah. I think like, it's about, it's about paying attention. It's about loving people. It's about trying to extend grace. I remember one of the first times I was a fairly young Christian. I'd been a Christian for probably within the first year, year and a half. And there were these three guys that were leaders in the church mm-hmm. ministry that I was part of. And I was in high school still just almost just finishing high school. And right. These are old guys. They're college students. Oh. They lived. They had their own apartment, and <laughs> uh, and so they were all in leadership in this church I was part yeah. of. And these guys were were, and I'm going to try to put them in the right words. These guys were disgusting pigs uh, <laughs> when it came to to physically the way they kept their house. Okay, I mean they would have cockroaches in the sink. They they wouldn't wash dishes for like a week. They would pile stuff up. They wouldn't even rinse the dishes. It's just it was disgusting. And what they would do is about every week, week and a half, they'd invite four or five of the young girls from the youth ministry over to their house and ask them to serve Jesus by cleaning their house. And it, and it, it uh, works. It, it take, oh, it, every time they, they would, they, they would, they would, they would <laughs> guilt, they would guilt and pressure these young girls into cleaning this disgusting house. Most of the girls wouldn't come back a second time, but they'd find some other new young girls and invite them over. Well, oh, these are cool. These are great godly leaders. And they'll, and they can, yeah, come on to our house. We're going to you know, have a Bible study or we're going to have a prayer time. And they do that. And then after they say, Hey, listen, um, we haven't a chance to clean our kitchen. Would you guys just serve us? You know, we're so busy be doing ministry and serving the Lord. And it was just, and it was disgusting on every level possible. It was disgusting spiritually. Yikes. It was disgusting socially, relationally, physically. Um, <laughs> physically. It was just, it was just disgusting. Yeah. So I saw, so the first time I was over there and saw this happen, Oh I asked gosh. somebody, is this, I said, that's, why would they do that? And they, and they said, oh no, that's like a whole deal. We do it every, 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 we just know if we wait a week and a half or so, we invite them there, you know, they'll do that for us. And so, um, so this was one of my first major confrontations with three guys who were leaders <laughs> oh over me gosh. in this ministry. And I wasn't gracious. I wasn't, I wasn't yeah. kind. I wasn't, uh, but I just, I just told them, you guys are, um, I was, I was young. I wasn't real sanctified. <laughs> I, I just went after them and I said, this is disgusting. This is ungodly. Uh, and I just let them have it. And they got angry at me and they kicked me out of their house. And, uh, and then each of them over the next probably three to nine months yeah. separately would came to me and said, thank you. Um, we needed a, we needed a spiritual kick in the, in the behind. We needed that. But at the time they, at the time I got excluded from things that they would invite people to because I was a jerk. Now I probably handle it in kind of a jerky way. Yeah. And looking back, I probably could have thought about it, maybe written a note, asked them a couple questions, got perspective. And I just, I just, I was so mad. I just let them have it. Yeah. Um, and my, my, you know, but here's the thing. Once I had done that with them, they felt very comfortable when they saw things in me yeah, to point yeah. them out in me. So you kind of right. mentioned earlier, and I had mentioned before that. that yeah, th- so the danger is when you say, we're going to move to that level of community and that level mm-hmm. of Christian fellowship that we will um, that will raise things that seem overt and blatant 
uh, and or things that maybe seem subtle and hard to see, but you go, man, there's there's a there's a problem here. Yeah, right. And when we raise those things, we can create a place where hopefully we can create community, mm-hmm. mutual accountability, challenge each other, and that and that's your know, discipleship actually becomes exciting when you have people around you who will ask the hard questions, who will right. encourage you, and then cheer you on when you're doing well, also, mm-hmm. and pray for you and support you on that journey. Yeah, man, that's. I'm still trying to understand <laughs> how that's even possible. They yeah. could make that happen. That's a, that's a wild story, man. Yeah. It's it's. Are you a, trying to figure it out, like, so that you can so do I can do so it? You can no, do no, no. <laughs> I, I'm just like blown away. I yeah. I I don't know what I would have done. Like, yeah. I, in your position, yeah. Yeah. and I, don't, I, you said you were younger in high school. I was I was probably uh, I was probably at that point uh, middle of my senior year. Or so, I, yeah. yeah, I don't even know how I would go about handling that. Or yeah, yeah. yeah. I I don't know if I would say anything right then because I don't yeah. know if I'd have the yeah. Um, stones, but man, that's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's such a crazy thing, but it's, it's, it's interesting though. That it sounds like the Lord used that moment in yeah. this, like, yeah. you know, they probably, um, exercised their, their feelings towards mm-hmm. that situation mm-hmm. with anger in the mm-hmm. moment. But, yeah. but like upon reflection mm-hmm. and like, yeah, they, they, they hadn't it, asked me to speak into their lives. Well, no, I was a young, I, new, new believer. Clearly, yeah. But, but the thing that was beautiful was that over time, all three of them uh, became guys that we had mutual respect. I ended up, ended up stepping into leadership in that ministry for a number of years when right. I was going my first couple of years of college. And we served side by side yeah. and they, they would talk about that and laugh and they said, man, we, the, the more t- the time went by, the more they realized how bad it was, right, right. Yeah. but they were fairly young and, and pretty self-centered and, and all pretty new believers. This is a ministry right. that's really evangelistic. So yeah. they were trying to figure out, you know, that's the, jur- that's the journey kids. of yeah. sanctification yeah. too, right? So it's, yeah. it's interesting. Cause I, I, you know, I, obviously when you, you talk about like, when you think back in like retrospect, like, uh, maybe you could have handled it better. Maybe you could have been more inquisitive about it. Mm-hmm. Maybe you could have like shown them, uh, the reality of the situation yeah. with, you know, thought provoking, you yeah. know, letter or your questions or, uh, well, I so, wasn't, I probably, I really wasn't there yet myself. I was <laughs> well, <still. laughs> well it's, so what, what I'm saying is like, mm-hmm. I think clearly you're saying that's not the right way to do it all yeah. the time, yeah. but maybe it can be used in that way too. It's, yeah. it's interesting. I guess it's just kind of the moment and, uh, being prayerful that the Lord yeah. will use it. That's an, yeah. yeah. Um, that's interesting. Hey, I wanted to kind of uh, shift a little bit here and uh, ask you this, something that I heard in your sermon that you you said um, you said that uh, God is not the author of sin, and that that's something that uh, you kind of stopped your your uh, discussion point uh, in your sermon. And I, I want to say something. That I'm I'm, yeah. I'm being clear. I'm not saying that God is the author of sin. So what do you what do you mean by that yeah. exactly? And and uh, can you just kind of dive into that with a little more detail? Yeah, when the Apostle Paul talks about that God can, can in effect, he's saying God can make something good come out of anything. Mm-hmm. God works all things together for good for those who love him or called according to his purposes. Right. So someone could take that and say, oh, so God causes all things so he can bring about some kind of good. Um, you know, human, tra- human yeah. trafficking is not... Uh, the plan of God. That's a uh, reality yeah. of sin, of brokenness, of Satan's reality in the world, of human brokenness, selfishness, uh, and sin gives birth to those things. Human evil brings gives birth to those things. You know, the demonic work of hell brings birth to those things. But even in the most evil, broken, demonic, horrible situation, somehow God can rewrite the script mm-hmm. and bring something good out of it. And so when you see, I, I think I think of in the first chapter of Second Corinthians where uh, the Apostle Paul says, he's talking about, uh, you know, blessed be the God of all comfort. God's the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we ourselves can comfort those in afflictions with the same comfort mm-hmm. we receive from God. It's saying, you know, okay, when we go through hard things, God comforts us and he uses our pain and our brokenness and sometimes the most horrible of situations. But as God brings his comfort to us, as he re- rewrites the script, he can use us to then to care for others going yeah. through the same pain yeah. and struggles, hardship, whatever, brokenness, whatever it is. And so we, we have a God who can miraculously and gl- in a glorious way turn the most horrible, rotten situation that comes out of human sin or out of the pit of hell. Mm-hmm. And God can still bring something good out of it. But to say that God caused that so that he could bring something good out of it, I think is entirely wrong. God is not the author of sin. Uh, he points out what sin is. He redeems us from sin, but he doesn't cause sin. God is not the author of evil. Mm-hmm. Evil is real, but God is not the cause of it. But when there's sin and when there's evil, God is the one who out of the worst situations that seem hopeless and empty, God still births 
things that bring him honor and glory yeah. and good things out of those. And I think all of us could look at our own lives and see something that, that we experienced or someone that close to us experienced that somehow out of the, the worst of things that, that just came from the absolute brokenness of humanity, the reality of sin and the pit of hell. Mm-hmm. And you go, but somehow through that, God did something redemptive. Yeah. And, and you, you, you'll hear people say, you say to people, when have you most experienced the presence of God? Oftentimes it's through the most hard and broken of places and yeah. times God draws near he's present even then he's not causing those things but he can bring he can rewrite the story and bring something good through those things. right yeah it's interesting how people can have kind of a uh this view of God like it's like a Munchausen's right proxy kind of thing or it's like uh, I, if you read the scriptures and you hear this good God and uh, mm-hmm. uh yeah it's it's tough to justify that view of 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 a God that you, the God that you see in scriptures. Uh, it's interesting, but, um, uh, yeah. Can you talk just, uh, a bit about just how receiving the grace of God and that you've been talking about in your sermon, um, receiving the grace of God and salvation through Jesus are actually, um, something that really pulls us together, uh, as a family. I, 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 I was hearing that and I was mm-hmm. just feeling this, how right now with everything that's happening, yeah. uh, we're still in this situation with, uh, COVID and, and just the, everything that's gone on this year, um, just really needing, uh, you know, you hear it all the time. We need community. Yeah. We need yeah. connection. We yeah. need, you know, and I, I think there was something that you kind of touched on briefly in your sermon, um, <clears throat> that, that really, uh, resonated with me and made mm-hmm. me feel like, man, I, I would love for Kevin to go in a little deeper on that with this idea that again, that mm-hmm. when we receive grace, when we receive salvation, yeah. that through Jesus, we can actually be uh, a family. We yeah. can be connected yeah. in a yeah. different way. Well, this, this is the portion of Romans where the apostle Paul talks about the fact that God is our Abba father, very intimate mm-hmm. name for God. Uh, and that we are heirs, right? Which means that we are children of God, co-heirs uh, that we have, you know, we have this connection that whether we like it or not, we have. And so I'm, I grew up in a family with five kids and uh, though I love them all, I didn't get to choose any of my siblings. Right. And in the family of God, we also don't get to choose our siblings. We're part of a family. And, and you had mentioned this unique time in history where there is so much tension, so much conflict, so much, uh, for many people, an ability to even have a conversation. Yeah. Um, around political uh, convictions, mm-hmm. around social issues. Uh, and that's heartbreaking. Uh, if, if, and I, I, I've been saying to our congregation on a regular basis, if anybody in this time of human history and in this time of American history, if anybody's going to model what it looks like to, uh, to disagree and love each other, mm-hmm. it's going to have to be Christians. Right. And if Christians can't look and say, uh, you know, I disagree with you, I don't see it that way, but I love you, and let's keep mm-hmm. walking together, let's talk this through this work. If Christians can't pull that off, I'm not sure who's going to. Right. And so I think as we're family, we need to learn to get along because we are family and to get along because it's what God wants for us. Yeah. And, you know, and I think about uh, our, our culture and our world mm-hmm. where almost anything seems to be a reason to divide, yeah. to disagree and yeah. to walk away from other people. And as Christians, I really believe that's not an option. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to spend forever together. And so we're going to have to learn how to be humble, to listen, to listen well to others. Yeah. Um, to, to, I had a, a pastor who I worked with years ago who had this great saying, we have to agree to disagree without being disagreeable. Yeah. And it's, it's a great thought. It's to say, okay, I can agree. I, can say, I don't agree with you on that, but I'm not going to be a jerk. I'm not going to hate yeah. you. I'm not going to become militant. And if there's anything right now, people are militant. People are angry. People are divided. And I think what a great moment in time for Christians to lead the way and say, there can be people who I fully disagree with, but I can love and embrace because yeah. they're made in the image of God, they're loved by God, and I'm going to love them too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's an interesting, because I, I think that's that's true, I think, with the with Christians when we have like the common ground of, of Christ. Yep. And, and there's there's something to be said about that, you know. You know, you could be a surfer and I could be a hiker and we, mm-hmm. we could say like, those are our things, but like we have this common ground in yep. Christ and there's there's a way that we can invest in each other. And, and you know, I, mm-hmm. I see that with the, my brothers, you know, yeah. um, very different people. Yeah. Um, and but there's there's that underlying family, mm-hmm. a familiar thing. Yeah. But also, you know, w- when you're talking about this crazy divisiveness with our, our, our country and, and, and everything yeah. in, in the world right now that's going on. I, 
yeah, it's it's also up to Christians to say, as a family, when yeah. we disagree, I think people see that, and yeah. and we can you know shine the light of Christ in such a way that we can say it's okay, like yeah. that's okay that we disagree, and we don't have to be militant towards each yeah. other because it's a Absolutely. powerful thing when when you see the way that family can you know work together and model something, but mm-hmm. then we can you know go on the 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 outside of that and Mm -hmm. show the world. It's a, it's a powerful thing. Um, Hey, I wanted to just kind of wrap up with something that, uh, yeah, it was interesting to me um, when you're, we're going through Romans right now and, and, and looking at the scriptures and stuff in, uh, in this past sermon that you just gave. um, I just wanted to ask you how salvation in Jesus, how that Mm can kind of unleash um, victory Mm -hmm. in our life. And, 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 Ultimately, you know, currently we are a part of eternity. Yeah. When we have yeah. salvation, we are now in eternity. Yeah. Yeah. And so what does that mean to you uh, when you said uh, that Jesus and salvation in Jesus mm-hmm. can mm-hmm. unleash victory yeah. in our life? Yeah. Well, I love how the Apostle Paul puts it because he doesn't just say we can walk in victory. He doesn't even just say we're conquerors. He says we're more than conquerors. Right. right. And so I, let, let me read uh, from Romans 8, 37 to 39, as kind of as we're drawing to a close here. Yeah. This, um, I, I love this. Uh, Paul says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, and listen to this, listen to this list. I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, or anything else, anything that's been missed, everything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, in all these things. We are more than conquerors. That's a declaration of victory mm-hmm. that comes not by my power, but the power of Jesus. Yeah. And I think this is why as Christians, okay, we talk about this topic of salvation. You come to the cross, you receive the grace of Jesus, you confess your sins, you take his hand, he becomes the savior, the one who washes you clean, the leader of your life, your Lord. You take his hand, you live for him the rest of your life. Uh, you're, you're living for him and growing in sanctification, not because you want to get him to love you. He already loved you when you were completely lost and broken, right. but now you're walking with him. And now you are more than a conqueror in what? In all these things, mm-hmm. in everything. And so as Christians, we can walk in victory when it comes to temptation, when it comes to sin, when it comes to broken relationships. We can walk in victory when it comes to divided communities where people won't talk to each other. Right. We can be more than a conqueror. And ultimately, I think what it's saying is over the power of Satan, sin, uh, the deceptions of the enemy, we don't have to give into that. We don't have to acquiesce. We don't have mm-hmm. to um, bow our knee. Uh, and, and you can say, I, I can walk as more than a conqueror. I would add also that living in this world that is becoming, and Romans 1 talks about this downward spiral into yeah. sin, it's becoming sin-saturated. Well, yeah, you look living at in the, it's, it's everywhere. You're yeah. living in this world where, where, where Paul goes through those four cycles downward to sin, and then finally at the end he says, not only do they do these things, but they approve of those yeah. who do them. There's this thumbs up, what everything goes. Mm-hmm. And you say, as a Christian, how do you, and, and, I, and I think a lot of people are feeling this way. How, how do I stand up for Jesus in this world? How do I live for Jesus in this world? Uh, how do I make an How do I make an impact in the in the public school systems that seem to be heading away from this? How do I make Im- impact in a, in a culture that seems to not care anymore? And 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 Paul is saying, and the Spirit of God is saying to us, and yet you are more than a conqueror mm-hmm. through whatever you face. And I think if Christians live with a de- not, with a defeated attitude, it's it's destructive. It's yeah, damaging. It's, it doesn't yeah. honor Jesus. I don't think we want, you know, when it says more than a conqueror, it's not like, okay, I'm going to beat everybody up because I'm in charge. No, it's saying because no. of what Christ has done, because of who he is, you walk in that victory at all times in all things, no matter what. And if we take that kind of disposition with humility, mm-hmm. because it wasn't us, it was Jesus. But in Christ, we are more than conquerors that we can walk in that reality. It's both powerful as we go forward it's compelling to a world right. that feels defeated and beat up and they can see it. there's people who actually feel confidence and hope they don't live under shame and they don't live under law or condemnation but they you know i believe that this is a unique time in history where if we walk in a confidence in jesus christ if we walk knowing that we are therefore uh, that there's no condemnation and we live without shame and yet we're seeking to live for Jesus. And when we stumble and fall, we don't lay there and, and, and mope for a month and try to pull ourselves together. We just stand up and say, Jesus, pick me up, put me back on my feet like a loving parent, dust me off and say, yeah. let's yeah. go. 
yeah. walk with me. Uh, that's compelling for a world that's feeling pretty beat up and discouraged. And so I, I hope that uh, all those who name the name of Jesus can walk in this more than conquerors yeah. uh, attitude that is reflected in lives that continue to pursue him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yeah, what a powerful uh thing to hang on to, you know, as, as we're closing, I know that a lot of people are struggling and Christians Mm -hmm. included that, that know these things that have, it's, you know, it's, as we were talking the, these different kind of areas of, of salvation, I think some that we don't really talk about a lot that people aren't really focused on. That's, Mm -hmm. you know, we need to move past that idea that salvation, like, Oh, I had salvation. Like I have it. It's done. I, when I said yes, it's over. Check the box, Um, check the box. And now I have my ticket and I'm, I'm good. But I, man, it's just a powerful thing. I'm now I'm going to be thinking about that a lot more. Uh, It's been, uh, it's been good to be in the seat and to hear these things. And it's, Mm -hmm. it's challenging me and it's reminding me to be looking at my, uh, my process of sanctification. And we, we've talked about that before this, this, uh, trajectory that you live Mm -hmm. as a Christian and how do, how am I growing? And this has been a, an interesting, um, place as you talked on Sunday and Mm -hmm. uh, with your sermon, but, but also just now listening to you and and hearing through this, these different, um, kind of aspects of what, true, full, a holistic view of salvation looks like it's, it's given me a lot to think about. So I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for spending the time, uh, going through this. Thank you for spending the time and studying Romans in such a way that you can share that with us, that you can, uh, kind of hand that over to the congregation and and the people who are listening to this podcast and, and we can wrestle with these things. I think there's a lot more, uh, to, to be done in our individual yeah. lives. As we look at Romans, it's challenging. It's, yeah. it's really challenging. It so is. I appreciate it. Thank you for going through this with us. Thank you for spending time with us today. Appreciate having you. Absolutely. Whether you're watching this podcast on the YouTube channel or listening on your podcast app, make sure to subscribe to hear our weekly episodes. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you next week with another one.